Here's what most people get wrong about convolutions. They focus too much on the code or the math without building up intuition first. Today, I want to give you that critical intuition by walking you through the analogy that finally made this concept click for me. Not only that, but I'm gonna give you my list of the seven key concepts that cover everything you need to know about modern convolutional layers. And finally, I'm gonna show you how to solve a super popular machine learning coding problem exactly about this topic. But before we dive in, if you like this content and want to learn more about machine learning and data science, be sure to subscribe so that you can stay up to date. Okay, let's get into the video. Convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, are some of the most powerful AI models out there, and interviewers love asking questions about them, specifically about convolutional layers. And when I first learned about them, I was kind of blown away by them because somehow these networks are able to take in raw pixels and convert it into numbers, text, bounding boxes, semantic segmentation masks, all these different things they're able to interpret from the raw pixels. But how? How do you design a model to do all these different things? I've worked with a ton of convolutional neural networks over my six years of experience in machine learning, and I wanna try to give you a little bit of intuition about how they work. Think of a convolutional layer like a restaurant critic with a very specific taste of food. And each window of pixels in the image is like a different dish on the menu. The critic goes over all the little windows of pixels trying each dish at a time and giving it a score. And the better the pattern in that window matches the exact pattern the critic is looking for, the higher that score will be. Depending on where this layer will be inside the neural networks affects which patterns the layer will look for. So if this is early in the neural network, it might look for simple things like, is it orange? Is there a corner in this window? But more deeper in the neural network, that's where you're gonna find more complex patterns. This can be things like, is there a bike in this part of the image? Is that there a person, some other object? Now, these critics are actually more formally known as kernels, and each kernel looks at all the different parts of the image and gives its own score for that part of the image. So what you end up is kind of a vector of scores for each pixel in the image. And these vectors of scores for each part of the image are actually more formally known as channels or features. But how do these critics actually quote unquote look for a pattern? Let's get a little more technical and take a look at the equation of a convolution. What this means is that each critic has its own set of weights which it gives for each part of the window. And it kind of scans over all the image grabbing all the different windows multiplying them by the weights and then summing up the result to get the score. While I was researching this video, I found a great interactive website, which I'll link in the description, and you can see right here, and has all these very cool visualizations that really help you understand this concept. Now, I want to give you some actual practical tools that you can walk away with from this video, especially because these technologies are changing so fast. So in this next part, I'm going to give you the seven key concepts of modern convolutional layers. These are input channels, groups, output channels, kernel size, stride, padding, and dilation. I imagine you're probably familiar with at least a few of these, but if you don't, don't worry, I'm gonna break them all down for you right now. The input channels are that vector of scores that your input has at each part of the image. And this means that each critic is going to have to go over all the scores in each part of the window it's looking at in order to calculate the score that it's going to give. And if this sounds like an expensive operation, you're right. But it doesn't always have to be like this because there's actually a parameter called groups which lets us break up those input scores into smaller chunks and then let each critic process its own little chunk. So for a group size of one, which is the default, this means that each critic is going to go over all those different scores in the input. But if you put like groups equals to four, this will divide those scores into chunks a fourth of the size of the original scores. And each critic is going to only process one fourth of those input channels which is really nice. Now, I love this concept and I use it all the time because it's a very simple and elegant way to dramatically reduce the number of parameters that your layer uses and the computational load. 
and usually it doesn't harm performance that much. But if each critic only processes a subset of the inputs, how do you know how many critics to choose? And you can change this by changing the number of output channels because each critic produces a score for every part of the image, meaning it produces a single channel. So if you increase the number of channels, this means you're increasing the number of critics, which actually means that you're increasing the number of patterns your layer is able to detect. Now, generally the more the better, but don't get too greedy because I've actually crashed my GPU many times using too many output channels which really overloads the memory and increases the computational load. Okay, kernel size. Now, remember that the critics are actually known as kernels and the size of the kernel means the size of the window that each critic will look at. Now, usually you're going to have square kernels like three by three or five by five windows, but if you want, you can actually have any shape that you'd like. However, if you don't use this next trick, you're going to get a kind of boundary problem in which the output is always going to be a little bit smaller than the input. So to fix this, you can use a method called padding, which adds kind of a few extra pixels around the edge of the image, usually filled with zeros. This is kind of like those beautiful golden frames around paintings, and we always put just the right amount of pixels in the padding to get the same sized output as the input or some multiple of that. Definitely master this concept because you'd be surprised in how many situations it comes up. For example, in NLP, natural language processing, this is a very common operation. This next concept tackles an assumption that we've been making the whole time. We've always been assuming the critic goes over the image one pixel at a time, choosing each window as it goes. But you can also do this two pixels at a time, three pixels at a time, and change the size of each jump. It's kind of like a food critic who's too lazy to try every single dish on the menu, so it tries every other dish. Just note that if you increase the stride, you'll actually reduce the size of the output of the convolution. And sometimes this is a desired thing. For example, if you want to learn more abstract concepts in the network. And there's actually a formula which ties all these things together and enables you to calculate the exact size of the output based on the padding, the size of your kernel and the stride that you use. Now I'm going to skim over it for now and we'll get back to it in a few minutes where I'll show you how to use this equation in a coding interview problem to make an amazing impression. Okay, this next concept is my favorite concept of them all, and it's called dilation. Do you remember that head massager thing that kind of opens up when you push it on the back of your head and sort of tickles you a little bit? Dilation is kind of like that. The whole time we're assuming that the panels or the pixels of the window were all sort of clumped together, but this doesn't have to be the case. You can spread out the pixels that you're looking for so that you can look for patterns at larger and larger areas. And this can be super useful for tasks like semantic segmentation, where you need to get kind of a better understanding of your surroundings. I think that's pretty cool. So that wraps up the seven key concepts you need to understand about convolutional layers. And I hope you feel awesome at this stage because getting so far, you really know more about convolutions now than most people do. Now, I'm sure you're eager to see these concepts work in action, so let's get right through it and in this next section, I'll show you how to solve a real interview problem using these concepts. Let's solve this classic coding problem from deepml.com and we're going to solve problem number 41, simple convolutional layer. In this problem, you're going to need to implement a 2D convolutional layer that implements different kernel sizes, stride, and padding. This means that we're only going to tackle concepts 3, 4, and 5 here. Now, before I show you the solution, pause the video and see if you can figure out how to solve it yourself. Got it? Good. Let's dive in. The main concept here is that we're going to need to use that equation that I showed you before so that we can actually calculate the size of the output matrix. And then all we need to do is systematically slide the kernel over the different parts of the image and calculate the output scores. This is sort of like building the frame of a building before you build the walls. 
you just want to first of all make sure everything is set up nice and tight before you start. And this includes padding the input image, calculating the size of the output array and creating it. And then you just start looping over the image and use the stride in a very careful way to see which window exactly you need to work on. Then you just multiply that window by the kernel, sum the results and you're done. Place it in the right place in the output and you're good to go. And that's how you solve this problem. Pretty straightforward, right? Now I want to give you another challenge. To test your understanding, try to think how you would extend this function to support different sized dilations. But either way, that's it for now. Just note that if you use packages such as PyTorch or TensorFlow, you're probably going to have all these things already implemented for you under the hood, but you'll have full control of all these parameters. So you really need to understand what they do. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new and I'll see you in the next one.